And one moment. Ed, is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Yeah, okay. Of course. Okay. Uh, uh, Off to check. Okay. Um, well, first of all, Ed, thank you for joining us tonight. It's really a pleasure uh, reading your resume, all the more so. And uh, I'm anxious to share a few comments about the work you've done. Um, Ed's uh, earned his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in physics um, at Wright State University, receiving his master's, I believe, in uh, 1989. Uh, for two years after that, he was a research assistant at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where he was and, and was also uh, adjunct faculty at Wright State. Um, his work for the Air Force sounds particularly interesting. Uh, perhaps he can't discuss it without killing us, but. Uh, and involved I'll tell you all, but I'd have to kill myself. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's he, how that works. He was doing work on electron mobility in various gases, including noble gases, atmospheric gases, um, and uh, silane, tetraethyl, orthosilicate, and boron tetrachloride. Why? I don't know, but uh, perhaps you can illuminate us on that. Um, for Quite a few years after that, from 1991 until 2008, uh, he was a space environment simulation engineer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in uh, uh, Greenbelt, Maryland. And he was involved there in the design, assembly, and research and development into space environment simulation systems uh, for a number of missions with which many astronomers and amateur astronomers are familiar. Uh, the Cassini missions, the Huygen lander, uh, the Nozomi mission, Contour, and MSL missions as well. And that work included uh, ultra-high vacuum systems, supersonic molecular beams, uh, beam nozzles, gas handling manifolds, particle time of flight systems, which I'm going to ask you about because it sounds fascinating, and spaceflight mass spectrometers, which gets close to the topic tonight. Since uh, 2008, uh, Ed has worked as a senior research scientist with the uh, Southwest Research Institute in Austin, Texas, where he works on development of space flight mass spectrometers. Um, this work includes also work on space environmental simulation systems, which will be of particular interest, I think, to us as astronomers, and also uh, laboratory systems for simulating atmospheres on various worlds, such as Venus, Mars, Enceladus, Titan, um, and um, uh, Europa, and also comets, I believe. Uh, he's also developed field deployable uh, mass spectrometers for terrestrial cave systems here on Earth, and that, that sounds interesting, and I think we'll have a few questions about that as well. Um, he has studied uh, lunar regolith sim simulants and also an actual Apollo 11 sample uh, in his lab. Uh, he was also a member of the Cassini mission team and is a member of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission uh, team. Um, he uh, recently, uh, if you tuned in early, you may have heard me compliment him on an incredible grant he received from NASA, $2.18 million. Uh, he submitted a proposal to NASA to modify a commercial mass spectrometer to use as a, a space qualified instrument for lunar surface operations. And Ed's topic tonight will deal with mass spectrometers uh, and their role in space flight in the future. And Ed, thank you again for joining us. This should be really interesting. I'll leave it oh, to you now. My pleasure. I'm happy to help out uh, Mitch and- uh, uh, And me. <laughs> yes, and, and you and, and Evansville uh, Astronomical Society. How, how do I do the uh, screen, screen share here? So you you're set up. All you have to do to sh is uh, pull up the application that you're wanting to share. And okay. So, so you're allowed. Okay, I'm going to move this. Switch my monitors around here so I'm... And start this up. Oh, it's not... Uh, it's not liking that. Why is that? So can you see uh, slides now? See you. Yeah. You, you see me? Have you hit the green share screen button at the bottom? 
Uh, I've got a stuck. Oh, I know. I think I know what this is. My my reminder is hanging up my windows. One one of those great features of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's a, you say there's a, there's a green, if you'll move your cursor, a bar will appear at the bottom and there will, there should be a green share screen button. I think I've got it expanded too much here. Um, I'm not seeing a green button. Your uh, inbox. Email, yeah. Okay. And your, your yeah. desktop. Yes. Yeah, see if I can't start this back up here. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Bingo. So, well, that, so are you seeing only the slide? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So, uh, Mitch and, uh, and uh, Brent. And I were in the Ohio State University Astronomy Club at uh, back at Ohio State, and uh, Mitch and I, I guess, spent a lot, and, and probably Brent spent a lot of time in the fifth floor of uh, Smith Lab in the astronomy department. That's where I actually ground my first uh, six-inch telescope mirror, a, a, a an F7 Newtonian that now sits in the Dobsonian configuration uh, behind the couch in our living room. But um, so we we. We interacted a number of times in Dayton, Ohio, uh, where I grew up, uh, because of the Apollo Rendezvous at uh, the Dayton Museum of Natural History, the Miami Valley Astronomical Society there, and the observatory at John Bryan State Park, uh, where we had held uh, stargazes, and the MVAS still do to this day. So, uh, and, and Mitch has been to our house, or my parents' house there in, in Dayton, and uh, we, uh, frequented uh, the local Marion's Pizzeria and uh, uh, fond memories. But here uh, I, I'm speaking about spaceflight mass spectrometry from the moon to the stars. I've got, uh, I, I'll blame NASA for not being able to call these slides uh, enough because there's a number of slides. I may be going through these uh, fairly fast, but uh, see if I can advance. Well, wow. that's curious. Okay, we got the interim stuff out of the way. Uh, the Cassini mission, this was the launch from uh, Canaveral Air Force Station back in 19, October 1997. It was a very important event there because that was the uh, mission. And uh, my mentor, Hasso Neiman, brought me from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to begin work on uh, the calibration systems, the laboratory systems that supported the, the construction of the Cassini ion and neutral mass spec and the Huygens uh, GCMS, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. And just for yucks, there, that's uh, Pluto you see in the lower right-hand corner since it's uh, been demoted from a planet. It won't be participating in any other place in these slides. But And of course, this is an artist's uh, rendition of uh, the Cassini spacecraft uh, at, at Saturn or at, at Titan, I guess it's showing here. You never would have seen this particular configuration for that mission, but it, it was it was a popular uh, painting at the time. But the work I'm doing now with gas interactions and trying to figure out what's going on with volatiles at the lunar surface involves uh, a subject we call uh, in situ resource utilization. I don't know if you've heard this term or not, but it's basically a live off the land concept. We go to the moon, bring as little as we as we can so that we can maximize our payload for other, other more critical resources and then operate at the lunar surface, making the things we need from engineered materials to architectural uh, structures to uh, fuel uh, from water for hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and oxygen as fuel and oxygen, of course, for breathing and whatever else we can come up with. Uh, I'm sure we will be amazed at, at what's produced once this, uh, once this takes place. And the uh, volatiles delivered to the lunar surface, this has gone on for, you know, for billions of years. And uh, there's quite a debate raging still about how these volatiles get to the lunar surface. 
and how they transport, how they're transported, how they move around. And uh, uh, but one thing I can attest to as a as a as an experimentalist, uh, since I I uh, destroy theory for food, uh, is that disturbing the lunar surface in any form or fashion is going to re is going to release gases. It's going to release volatiles. And uh, it, in this particular uh, NASA uh, graphic, you can see how they're how forward thinking they they are at the moment. This is a NASA graphic, and they're showing basically 3D printing or sort of an extruded regolith uh, robot here that's uh, heating the material, heating the uh, the base material, your your feedstock in, in a uh, a vat, and then uh, extruding that in order to form uh, a a a blast shield or something similar at the lunar surface to keep uh, the exhaust plumes from spacecraft uh, from blowing dust all over the place, all over the equipment. Dust being a serious uh, part of trying to operate at the lunar surface. I, I put in here, but. So our results show that Disturbing the regolith at all is going to release gases. And I've done these experiments in the lab with the lunar simulant. This is a scan of, of carbon dioxide, mass 44, showing where uh, the simulant exposed to a UV flashlight, it releases CO2 gas. This was a simulant that had been in the vacuum system for months, had been baked out several times, and it still delivered gas when it was disturbed mechanically or disturbed with a, just a UV laser. In fact, I, I was able to release gas gases with a, a anything a shorter than the green wavelength. With green green LEDs or or shorter wavelengths, I was able to release gas from this uh, simulant in inside an uh, extreme high vacuum chamber. So I know that just just from grain on grain interaction, uh, carbon dioxide molecules are going to be released, or, or gases will be released. From the from uh, the lunar samples, from the lunar surface, from the regolith, from from basically any material that's this finely divided, and the grains are uh, interacting with each other. So, I don't know if that's a repeat or what here, and I apologize if these slides aren't fully cold. This is the one zero zero eight four sample that's in my lab now. Uh, this is a photograph shortly after it was sealed up showing a couple of thermocouples uh, into the material, one uh, to the bottom of the material, one to the upper portions of it, so we can monitor the temperature while we were doing uh, gas exposure experiments. But this uh, 10084 was basically the last, uh, the, the last material uh, Neil Armstrong shoveled into the rock box before bringing the box on board uh, the uh, lunar module. Uh, basically, Houston said, well, why don't you shovel that stuff in there and it'll keep the uh, the rocks from banging against each other on the way, way back to Earth. So I, I tell students in the lab that this is, in fact, the first interplanetary packing peanuts. So uh, the uh, 10084 was, was used to, uh, to pad the rock box and keep the rocks from banging against each other. It, it was in... Uh, plastic envelopes or plastic Ziploc bags or something similar uh, to keep it from spreading all over the place. But this is that particular sample. It's considered one of the most researched samples uh, of lunar materials we have because of the quantity that was brought back. So what is a mass spectrometer? Basically, we start out, we have an inlet and the inlet is on the uh, left at the bottom of the photo. This is the actual instrument, uh, commercial instrument that we will be modifying to produce a lunar prototype. And uh, the source is an ion source. It's basically a filament, uh, typically operates at about 100, about 70 electron volts or 70 volts on the filament, it bombards the uh, gases that are present in that ionization region and converts them into ions. Of course, once we have ions, we can steer them and direct them and focus them and so forth. So the next portion of the, of the instrument is the analyzer. In the case of our uh, instrument here, it's a quadrupole. 
which is four rods that have uh, 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 an RF field superposed on uh, a DC voltage that when scanned allows uh, only a particular mass to charge ratio to pass all the way through the instrument. And when that happens, the ion arrives at the ion detector. The, the detector here is an electron, uh, is a, uh, uh, an electron multiplier. So basically the, uh, the uh, ion bombards the, the mouth or, or uh, a little, little trumpet on the multiplier and uh, cascades into the interior uh, under a high voltage on, on the uh, multiplier. And then the data come out and uh, as we scan through the DC voltage, we can get the masses or mass to charge ratio characteristic of what gas was present as, as it was being ionized. So using that instrument, see if I can, and we show electro, the uh, wiring and the vacuum flange, of course we won't need that at the lunar surface, and then the feed throughs at the back of the instrument. And this, uh, I don't believe this has ever been shown in public. Uh, it comes from the Lunar uh, Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. It's their data available publicly to anyone who uh, gets on the, the planetary data system and looks for looks for these data. This was sort of a random, I, I just wanted to show what some of these mass spectra look like. So I picked a random date. I believe this was January 4th of 2014, about a month after the uh, Chang'e 3 landed at the lunar surface and the mass spec found nothing during that landing, a lesson probably not lost on the Pentagon or, or the Chinese. But in this photo, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. You can see the cursor? Okay. Yes. So the largest peak we see here uh, from Laddie's uh, neutral mass spec is uh, oxygen. This is uh, most likely sputtered oxygen. The most common atom at the lunar surface is oxygen. But we see some other things that's interesting too. At mass 23, we see sodium. And uh, at mass 39, we see potassium. And then this uh, mass 35, mass 37, this is the... These are the chlorine peaks, uh, and, and this ratio looks fairly terrestrial. And uh, we also see some elemental carbon here, which I, I thought was interesting. But uh, it, this has not been published by the, the Laddie team, so I, I would consider these results preliminary. But it just shows that from a, for an orbiting mass spectrometer of uh, what we can see or orbiting the, uh, the moon. So oh, this is the uh, more moon stuff. This is my ultimate goal, is to basically produce a, a mass spectrometer. It could be handheld, could be held by a rover, uh, it could be on a robot, it could be orbited from, uh, from space, and could be used to analyze uh, the regolith, the, the gases that are going to come off the lunar surface, and could be used uh, for probing the regolith in order to determine where the interesting gases are or the uh, captured uh, reservoirs of uh, volatiles. So that's, uh, that's the pie in the sky thinking here. And apparently NASA thought it was, uh, it was worthy of consideration. But so the, I consider this the most important moon part. But uh, coming out from the inner solar system, uh, Starting with the first planet, first rock from the sun, Mercury, I believe these are elevation data from uh, Messenger. Uh, Brent Arkinall could, could tell us if I'm, if I'm wrong there, but at, yeah. at Mercury. Yeah, they're done with the altimeter and with stereo data from Messenger and they were made at USGS. Yeah, that's a beautiful map. I mean, it's false color, but you can see the, the highlands of, uh, of uh, Mercury and how it's, uh, resembles the moon in some respects. And of course, the uh, volatiles were, uh, you know, water vapor was detected at the poles at Mercury, but the mass scanning for the mass spectrometer board uh, messenger, uh, we were able to see some, some things that we saw in the, in the LADI data for the moon. We see a sodium at about mass. <clears throat> Looks like we lost our uh, our speaker.
and uh, Chuck, you're still on, correct? I'm here, yes. Okay, let me see if I can ping him. Doesn't look like I have a phone number for him. Nor I. Should have asked. Let me go back and, and see. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording while we're having these yeah. technical difficulties. But uh, you know, I heard a rumor that uh, it could have been photon torpedoes. But so anyway, the remaining planets with at, with atmospheres in our solar system that uh, haven't been investigated and uh, wait someday when we have uh, probes to enter their atmospheres and, and reveal some of their secrets. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, they're far out. Uh, Saturn is almost a billion miles from the sun. So it takes so long for these missions. Uh, it's, it's something to we need to uh, strive for, a, a goal and uh, It'll be some years off before we probe those atmospheres and beginning the star part of, of uh, how we get to the stars. This invader here, this is uh, Oumuamua, the asteroid that uh, was discovered 2017 on a hyperbolic uh, path through the solar system and was identified and, and named as the first interstellar uh, object in the solar system. Uh, I being the uh, the abbreviation for an interstellar object, and pronounced uh, the, this is a Hawaiian word meaning uh, visitor or scout or something like that, and it's pronounced O Mua Mua, and uh, I mentioned uh, this not to be confused with the asteroid U Mau Mau or more correctly known as uh, as the asteroid Papa Umau Mau. I know it's a, it's a astronomical humor. But once, uh, once you let one of them in, uh, these riffraff seem to come, uh, more of them seem to invade. This is the second interstellar object Comet Borisov identified as uh, being of interstellar origin by its hyperbolic uh, trajectory. So how do we get mass spectrometry to the stars? Well, maybe some of the planets and comets are already here in our solar system. Maybe they're on the surface of the moon. Well, they have to be. But I'm, I'll just leave this up. It has detail in it, but long story short, these interstellar dust particles that are collected in the upper atmosphere of the Earth uh, or in uh, space by spacecraft like the Stardust mission, uh, using very light materials to capture particles and grains uh, from space, 
those materials show clues to uh, astrochemistry taking place in the interstellar medium. And in the case of silicon carbide, I've seen a lot of papers over re recent years basically describing uh, silicon carbide formation in the upper atmospheres, uh, uh, upper envelopes, if you will, I guess, of the, the uh, asymptotic giant branch stars. So there's some complex chemistry taking place uh, in, the, in, in the galaxy by various stars of different uh, ages and different uh, compositions, different uh, metallicities. And the materials we find in our, even the meteorites and, and uh, the, the materials that have composed the star, the uh, terrestrial planets and the bodies in our solar system show signs of uh, materials that have vastly differing isotopic ratios in those particles. Basically impossible to have come from the same bodies or the same, even the same solar system. So. The theory currently is that there are many uh, influences on the formation in, in the chemistry of our the circumstellar disk around our sun when the planets were forming and a number of bodies in the galaxy, a number of uh, perhaps supernova and uh, giant stars and so forth contributed uh, grains that actually in a way, represent a, a, a textbook of what uh, the astrochemistry taking place in, in the uh, galaxy. So that's how mass spectrometry of these particles in the laboratory using a laser for ablation and so forth, we can vaporize these uh, materials and measure by mass spectrometry the gases that evolve and uh, determine what the isotopic compositions are and, and where these grains uh, originated from. So I think they basically think that you know there there are multiple fingerprints of various stars that are on the uh, materials that were incorporated into the uh, the grains that eventually formed the planets. And NASA actually has a curation facility for inter interstellar uh, uh, dust particles, and uh, specifically for stardust, the Stardust mission. And these uh, samples can be requested from, I believe these held at Johnson Space Center, and uh, investigated in the laboratory for uh, further um, searching for further clues as to the composition of uh, the materials that made up our, our solar, our planets and the astrochemistry that takes place in the atmospheres of stars. So that's it for me, pretty much. If you have questions now, I know we're late, but I'm uh, I'm, I'm willing to answer questions. And this is just a slide uh, for my lab. This is my standard boilerplate for uh, what goes on in there. Um, I have a question, Ed, if I may. Um, sure. You mentioned that the Apollo sample had been passed from one researcher to another uh, quite frequently, apparently. Is that correct? And if well, so... Well, my, my question is, uh, what uh, limits are placed on the use of the sample so as to pre prevent contamination for subsequent researchers? Well, they have pretty extensive notes. Uh, 10084 is one of the most analyzed samples, but there, there are various, I don't know if you call I forgot what they call them, cuts uh, of, the, of the sample. The original sample was a, a few kilograms or... Mm. A number of kilograms, but each one of them has a pretty good uh, pedigree, if you will, describing how it was used, how it was analyzed, who, who had worked on it. And this sample was not, I, I specifically requested a sample uh, that was not pristine. I wanted something that had been uh, previously, you know, in a laboratory, but hadn't been altered significantly. And I, I wanted to make my mistakes with it. I didn't want, I, I didn't think I was I, uh, good, good enough of a researcher to be given. A, I wanted to make some mistakes first. That's why I started with the simulant. And then I requested a sample. This particular sample is actually 10084.27 or 10084,27. And in their catalog, it shows it as a 10 gram sample. 
Now, when I uh, that's requested- 10, That's 10 grams in the picture? Yes, a actually, no, what's in the picture is uh, eight grams. I separated it and kept two grams in the, in the safe in case I, something happened and I destroyed it. <laughs> I, I would still have 20% of it left that I didn't mess up, right? So uh, yeah, that's about eight, eight grams of the 10 grams that's in, in that chamber. And when I requested it, uh, I just I just looked through the catalog and picked the one. Uh, I, I needed something about 10 grams in size. So I, I looked through the catalog. There were a number of them. And I selected that one. And I said, okay, can I have that one? Or can I borrow that one? And they said, well, I, I got a response back. said, well, CAPTEM, there's a group, uh, I forgot what the acronym is for, that actually uh, oversees the display dispensing of the uh, curated lunar samples. They, they said they had a sticker shock over my request for 10 grams and asked why I needed so much. And I said, well, I could probably get by one gram, but I explained how my experiment worked and how I was using uh, mechanical flags to till the material. Unfortunately, that mechanical flag on the rotary feed through was destroyed by so many bakeouts on the uh, JSC 1A. I was unable to use it for this actual a lunar sample. I'm hoping I might be able. I requested a COVID-19 extension on my loan agreement, and I was hoping they would let me uh, give me a few more uh, months so that I could finish up my experiments that I wanted to do with this sample. When I requested it, they said uh, when it came to the institute, the loan agreement is uh, between Johnson Space Flight Center and and. Uh, uh, Southwest Research Institute with me as the PI and the contracts office, the legal people called over because they needed to record a, a, a dollar value for the item that was on loan. And uh, NASA had changed the language since the last time I had written a, a loan agreement. And the, the uh, NASA currently says this is a uh, priceless national resource. So the administration up the hill wanted to know they had to put a number down so how many zeros were in priceless <laughs> so i i told them all of them so you, you want to know how many zeros are in priceless all of them so anyway i don't know what they put down for the final number but uh if uh, i can't get an extension i'll have to return the sample in a few weeks and uh, i wouldn't be able to continue my work i, I wanted to expose it to uh small amounts of oxygen and I also want to till it to see how uh, what gases escape from the actual lunar sample compared to the lunar simulant that I did experiments on earlier. Chuck, this is Mitch. Can I follow up with your question with a question? Sure. Hey Ed, it's Mitch. So on hey, Mitch. 084, um, normally when NASA gives you a sample, they Normally, don't they ask that you not do destructive tests on it? Just yes. the fact that you're mechanically uh, uh, manipulating it, you're going to have volatiles uh, escape. Isn't that a destructive test? In the purest sense, I would have to say yes as an experimentalist. But actually, when they brought these samples back and they broke the boxes open on the floor of the receiving laboratory at Johnson Space Center, they were immediately destroyed. And <laughs> that's because we're in a fluid environment. This fluid that keeps us alive is a liquid. I mean, it's not a liquid technically, but it is governed by, by fluid uh, hydrodynamics. The pressures at the lunar surface at the equator at midnight are 15 orders of magnitude below our laboratory pressure. So the, the mean free path, uh, I mean, the, the collision frequency of atoms or molecules in air, uh, a mono layer of water vapor will form in, in, in a nanosecond or two, just from the one and a half percent of water that's, that's in air. So honestly, uh, the samples are immediately destroyed to some extent. There's destructive uh, events occurring. It's destructive to open the sample to the lab air and everybody's doing that. So. The way to properly do this, uh, the best I've seen was by the Japanese 
with their uh, sample brought back from the asteroid, they actually opened the container. They had three vacuum systems and each one of those had a different purpose. The first vacuum system, the, the capsule was placed into and it was cleaned in the first vacuum system. And then it wasn't opened until it was inserted into the second vacuum system. So that, that basically, not only does that keep the sample pure, it also allows the investigator to measure whatever trapped volatiles escaped along with those grains that were transported from the asteroid. So this is a this is a problem with the lunar surface. I, I'm, we brought back rock boxes, but everything leaked. So atmospheric gases got into the box, but we don't know what gases were brought back along with those samples. So when we were returned to the moon and we want to get real serious about the volatiles that are present in those grains, and in some cases we're talking the possible uh, paleocosmic history of the inner solar system of volatile gases is preserved at the lunar surface. And, and it, it's important to investigate those. And, and I've tried to emphasize, I've tried to, imp tried to get the, uh, the lunar science community to understand that we need to place sentinel instruments at the lunar surface along with our equipment and, and along with our spacecraft so we understand how we are altering altering that environment before it's you know completely changed uh, irreversibly i mean uh, at landing sites we know we are affecting the background we we saw that in the pressure gauges and the mass spectrometer from apollo 17 deployed at the lunar surface so uh, how 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 are we altering the fidelity uh, of the science that we're trying to uh, trying to dig out of the lunar surface. So yes, I think these these samples are. I told them I was <laughs> in the the loose definition not going to conduct any destructive uh, experiments with the one zero zero eight four, but uh, I had planned to expose it to ammonia. The problem was when I first did this with the simulant, I could not understand the chemistry of what was taking place. So I, uh, I did not conduct the uh, agreed upon experiment with ammonia on the Apollo sample because it appeared to me that it was going to be chemically destructive to the material and not something I could merely uh, remove by baking it uh, while under vacuum to drive off the at whatever adventitious gas might be present. It looks like ammonia at the lunar surface is going to do some, uh, I don't know what it's doing. Uh, I'm not enough of a chemist at this point to be able to interpret what's going on, but the ammonia is reacting with these tiny grains uh, of rock. And the fact that they've discovered ammonia at the lunar poles from the l -cross impact suggests to me a rather significant source of ammonia has collected on the moon with time in order to be preserved at the poles. Thank you. Yeah, that sure. That that was that was interesting. Uh, so all the all the stuff they do at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory uh, at Johnson Space Center uh, is just kind of like not do any more harm. The harm has already been done because they had all the atmospheres of the oxygen uh, in the capsules coming back and the leaky boxes and the transportation and uh, before they even got to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory and opened it in the glove boxes. And, and what you're saying is, is the vacuum on the moon is superior to anything that they can create at Johnson Space Center, right? Yes, and even they have some samples they call pristine and they have some cores. They actually have a program to study those. We can submit proposals for uh, how we might want to analyze the, the most pristine of the lunar samples that remain, the Apollo samples remaining. But the, the issue really is, it, the way I explain it is at, uh, sea level pressure, the difference between sea level pressure and the pressure at the lunar equator at lunar midnight, the difference is the, the 15 orders of magnitude, to put that in perspective, that's the difference between the size of your microwave and the diameter of a proton. 
or put another way, it's a, it's the difference between uh, going in the other direction. It's the difference between the length of a school bus and the distance to Alpha Centauri. So it, it's it's we can talk about what happens at the lunar surface at these extreme high vacuum conditions, but it is so far out outside our regular experience. We we only knew what we knew. So when we when we go back, you know, it's been half a century. When we go back, we just need to do a better job. It's, it's not, I'm not impugning uh, what we did because uh, we were flying by the seat of our pants with our hair on fire going to the moon. Uh, it, it was just, you know, uh, incredible missions and we're still mining the data. But uh, when we go back, we need to capture everything that's there and do a better job preserving whatever gases are present, especially now that we know there are, there are reservoirs of volatiles at the lunar surface. That's a great mystery we need to unravel. On your, on your grant for your mass spec, so you're going to take a, a COTS item and, and are, you, are you ruggedizing it? Is it a packaging or a combination? What all, what all are you uh, 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 doing well, to that thing to get it into space? You, you hit them all right there, I think. So, uh, yes, we're ruggedizing them. We will actually be putting them on the shake table to look at the mechanical uh, issues that are related to the uh, supporting the, the electrodes, for instance, the wiring, the filament. The filament is actually a, sort of a circular filament on the uh, XTOR. So we would like to... Uh, learn how the thing will weaken or what we can do to stiffen portions of it mechanically. On the electronics side, we also uh, want to see what flies off of the printed circuit board, but I think before we even do that, we know there are parts we have to replace because it has electrolytic capacitors, for instance. And electrolytic caps, the uh, um, they explode in vacuum, so that's Order your tantalum caps immediately. What's that? Or if you're using tantalum, better get them on order. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think we have a reservoir here. I mean, we have some uh, inventory of parts, but uh, yeah, we're we're uh, we're going to do what we can. We it's also possible we could pot some of these things. We don't want to. We don't want to do that if we don't have to. But. Given the budget that we have and the turnaround uh, time, uh, we're, we're going to we're going to do whatever we can to see if we can't get a prototype uh, for flight that that will survive launch and uh, will make it to the. Yeah, well, potting is going to take care of your mechanical and also you know any arcing as well. So, might you might yeah. kill two birds with one stone. Oh, I didn't want to say kill, uh, resolve, or fix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I think, well, as it turns out, India, the Indian Space Research Organization uh, flew one of these to the moon and crashed it into the moon on their moon impact probe of the Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft. Problem is, they, there, there was a real problem with the way the instrument was calibrated and... and uh, interpretation of the results and and sealing it for flight and uh, and other things so their, their instrument was uh, contaminated before before it left the earth i think and uh, it the, their detection of water was typical of turning on an xtor in the lab we see water like that all the time and uh, it, it has to be the instrument when i baked out the cassini ion and neutral mass spectrometer I baked the detector end of the instrument to um, 250 degrees C, the end of the instrument with the multiplier. And then the tube of the instrument I baked to 225 C. And then my entire vacuum system was baked to 200 degrees C. Everything except the inlet to the, uh, to the magnetically levitated turbo pump. So that's the way to get a, a clean clean instrument uh, flying to Saturn. And uh, we have to do the same thing. We've actually, 
Laddie, uh, um, I'm sorry to say, uh, having looked through the data, uh, shows signs of a significant terrestrial contamination that does not change with with altitude or time or uh, it, and there was contamination aboard the mass spectrometers from Apollo 15 and 16. So it would be nice if we could get back to lunar orbit and have a really clean instrument uh, that doesn't suffer from uh, contaminants that were maybe a, a result of cleaning or or wiring or something like that. And of course, spacecraft need to be cleaner too. We can't have a an instrument measuring uh, parts per billion when the spacecraft is a, like a flying skunk. So, uh, but NASA wants to make sure instruments are uh, play well with others. The, the problem with uh, like UV instruments and uh, mass spectrometers is that they, they, they are looking for things at, at, at such detection levels that uh, it's very easy to to pick up something off the spacecraft. Spacecraft are just filthy. So we need to build a cleaner and cleaner spacecraft and that's not cheap either. Uh, Ed, briefly, what is a particle time of flight? What are those studies about? That interesting sure, well, uh, there's a gated uh, ion and electron detectors, uh, charged particle sensors where uh, you basically pass through a screen or something like that uh, and you alternate uh, a current on the, those screens to allow ions to pass through or not pass through. The one I operated at uh, Wright-Pat was a, uh, a what we call a pulsed Townsend uh, discharge uh, device. It was basically a, a photo cathode that we struck with the UV pulse and the electrons would form on the inside of the, uh, the uh, gold and palladium coating that, that represented the uh, photocathode and the electrons would be injected into a drift tube and they would cross a, a drift space that was basically 6.5 centimeters long and we would time that and basically that would give us information on the mobility of the electrons in that particular gas at that particular pressure. Now, when we do that uh, for various pressures, we end up uh, measuring the mobility of the electron over a, a range of pressures. We can, we can find out um, th there are some curious behaviors in, in gases. Uh, we can, make uh, what we call a fast gas, and that's a gas in which uh, the electrons cross very quickly without scattering uh, in, you know, doing a random walk through the, through the density of the gas. And as it turns out, we actually, the, the electrons in that drift tube will typically travel 200 times the length of the tube because of collisions. <laughs> so those, those particles are actually bouncing. That's how, that's how dense gas is, right? So those electrons will bounce around so many times that by the time they've reached the, the, uh, the, the anode, they've actually traveled 200 times the length. So what the Air Force is trying to do to make faster gases for sensors and for uh, switches and uh, so forth was to get fast gas mixtures where certain gases mixed in with uh, whatever the primary gas was would cause it to, uh, it'd be less likely to arc or scatter the, the ions and so forth, less, less li likely to ionize, for instance. And, and this comes in handy when you're building insulators for transformers and things like that. I mean, when the transformers in a gas, you say, um, the coils or whatever, uh, wiring and so forth. It, it come, it's important when they build things like uh, power stations, tiny substations that they put into, say, Rome, where you've got ancient streets and narrow alleys and they need to put a, a, an electrical substation inside uh, Rome without ruining the, the ancient right, architecture. Right. So they, they build these uh, very, <laughs> you know, these, these, they put a lot of voltage inside these, uh, these substations and they put gases in there that will quench uh, any ions that or any arcing that's trying to form and uh, 
that's part of the research. The rest of it was how, how to make a switch, as a, my boss there used to say. Uh, any, any switch will work once. But the idea when they're switching a million volts at a million amps is to have a switch that will work, work repeat, repeatedly. And these so-called plasma discharge switches uh, would allow them to do that. And it's a, a very carefully uh, designed gas so that uh, it will break the <laughs> discharge when the electrodes separate. Right. Any other questions from anyone? Well, Ed, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I deeply appreciate it. The program was fantastic and uh, well, your work is even more so, good luck with your project. Um, I know it will not come with any deadlines or pressure whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pressure's already on. And you'll have to come back and tell us how it all worked out later on. I, I thank you again for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. I'll do that, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Thanks thank from you. the Evansville Astronomical Society. I'm going thank to, uh, to stop you. the- uh, You're uh, welcome. Uh, but uh, please uh, 